This is Corporate Warrior, high-intensity training lifestyle and business with Lawrence Neal, helping you improve your health and physique, become a great personal trainer, and start and grow your hit business. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hi friend, I'm Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the high intensity training podcast to help you improve your own health and your physique, become a great personal trainer and start and grow your high intensity training business. My former guests include the who's who in HIT, people like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Jim Flanagan, health, fitness and nutrition giants like Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, successful HIT entrepreneurs and exercise scientists like Luke Carlson, Dr. James Fisher, Dr. Jürgen Giesing and many, many more. My guest today is Andy Magnus. You can contact Andy over at ultramentalbook.com, where you can also pick up a copy of Ultramental, an excellent book on how to use high-intensity training principles to succeed in adventure races. This is Andy's second appearance on the podcast. You can find part one in the show notes over at corporatewarrior.co forward slash Magnus. Andy Magnus is many things, a husband, father, recreational philosopher, novice gardener, reluctant homeowner, occasional adventurer, part-time athlete, race director, youth philanthropist, burgeoning author, and eternal possibilitist, not to men- mention avid neologist. Regardless of which hat he is wearing at the moment, he is always a critical thinker and loves nothing more than questioning everything. Andy is an avid climber and mountaineer. And during his younger days, Andy followed his twin brother, Jason, into the world of extreme endurance adventure sports more than a decade ago. His experiments in high intensity training for these events began as he tried to keep up with Jason while simultaneously starting a family and going back to graduate school in physics. Andy has had continuous success competing in a variety of ultra endurance disciplines despite reducing his weekly training commitment from three hours a week in 2007 to between 30 and 60 minutes a week at present. He has recently moved to Teanau in New Zealand. Andy Magnus is super impressive, a very unique individual indeed. I really, really enjoy talking to him and uh, this was uh, really, really enjoyable. Um, Andy has taken hit principles to the absolute extreme and used them to prepare for the most extreme endurance races you can possibly imagine. In his last major race, the God Zone, one of the toughest adventure races on the planet, which spans over 10 days and includes running, swimming, climbing, ropes, trekking, biking, canoeing, rafting and kayaking, Andy's team came seventh out of 100 teams that entered. And now when you think about that in the context that Andy is training very, very little in comparison to many of his uh, competition, it's quite fascinating indeed. Now, a quick warning about this one. Um, Andy does talk a lot about the God Zone. We really get into detail in terms of what the event was like, how it benefited his life, and what he learned from it, how he prepared better next time, all of that good stuff. Um, 
But we do also get into some pretty gruesome detail with regard to him contracting trench foot and everything that that entailed. Uh, so if you are eating, you might not want to listen to this because um, it's pretty gruesome, but it's really, really interesting. So I do, I do encourage you to uh, listen to this, but perhaps whilst you're eating a meal might not be ideal. In terms of what was discussed, I am merely scratching the surface. Obviously, we talk a lot about God's own because it's fascinating. We talk about how he cultivates gratitude and resilience. We talk about training for hypertrophy versus skill and how when you're pursuing different things and exercises, there's always trade-offs that you can't really avoid. Uh, we talk about how to use high-intensity training to succeed in endurance events. Um, we talk about Andy's lifestyle. Uh, we followed a quite a similar path, although Andy sounds a little bit more interesting lifestyle than my own, um, in that he's gone from a, a fairly urbanized lifestyle, I uh, believe, back in the US, um, to living in a very rural place in New Zealand. Uh, has a very, very interesting life, does a lot of odd jobs to earn a living, lots of very interesting things that he's just passionate about that are typically very active. Um, it just does a lot of very interesting stuff. And I find it interesting to hear how Andy's crafted is quite interesting lifestyle. Um, we talk a lot about the obsession around building muscle mass um, and the impossible pursuit of the ideal. Uh, you know, I've spoken a lot about this in previous episodes about how I have had problems myself in terms of um, managing my own expectations and my own psychological um, deficits with regard to the way I, I, I see myself and set goals for myself and things like that. We talk a lot about that in this episode and it's really interesting to get Andy's uh, perspective on this because um, he's also had a similar problem himself. Now, I will say that this I... This episode preceded my recent episodes with Doug McGuff on how to manage expectations and why not to potentially bulk up and things like that. Um, so it'll, it'll make you laugh because you'll hear me talking about how I'm pursuing this goal of this calorie intake and how it might all be for naught. And um, obviously, if you've listened to the more recent episodes, you'll see that that's exactly the conclusion I came to. And I very quickly stopped doing that and um, you know got my expectations back in check. And, uh, and now I'm a lot happier about how I look, actually. Um, so if you are also struggling with that, I do encourage you to listen to my episodes with Doug on managing your expectations. And the episode's called Why You Should Not Bulk Up. Uh, I think it's episode 161. I will link to it in the show notes as well. Um, we talk a lot in this one about social media, the downsides to consuming too much social media um, and how that can really have a bad impact on your mental health. We talk about productivity. We talk about intermittent fasting and much, much more than that. If you want the show notes, please go to corporate warrior.co forward slash magnus and now without any further ado i give you the incredible andy magnus andy welcome back to corporate warrior Oh, it's good to finally connect after so many years. <laughs> so many years and so interested to know what you've been up to um, in the you know, in that time. I think, you know, certainly when we spoke first all those years ago, when I say all those years, 2015 was obviously our, our first podcast. You know, you were really, really unique and you still are a very unique individual. Um, the first person I had come across who was using high intensity training principles to train for um, adventure races, you know, it's like almost the complete opposite end of the spectrum in terms of like volume, um, and exercise. So really, really fascinating. And I'm sure many people listen to that and have since, uh, changed their own approach to something far more sustainable. So, you know, since we've spoke last, what have you been up to? Give us an update on, you know, stuff you've been focused on races, training, that type of thing. Yeah, um, I've basically been kind of doing the same thing that I was doing before. I've refined it a bit. Um, I have quite um, a lot going on um, here in New Zealand. For those that don't know, I've, I, I moved to New Zealand just before that first podcast. Um, and um, I had a complete change of scene when I was initially um, dealing with high-intensity training. Um, and and you can stick my book on there if you want, which was written a, about a year before I talked to you. Yep. But I was focusing a lot on um, on using um, stuff in the gym. I was on treadmills and stationary bikes and things like that and really pushing the envelope and seeing how much I could get out of five, five or ten minute workouts. Um, I now live in a very small rural town in New Zealand, and so I don't have access to that equipment. Um, and so it's been a good experiment for me to see how well the same – approach um, works when I don't have uh, a heat and climate controlled environment 
um, and constant feedback and, and stuff like that. So that's been kind of the biggest transition for me over the last few years. I'm still, I'm still, my base workout load is roughly 30 minutes a week. Oh, even less. <laughs> it, yeah, it is even less. And, and so, so I'll give you a rundown of what I do, um, on, on a weekly basis now. And I do a, a either a one mile time trial on running or I'll do a four by 400, um, sprint workout. Mm-hmm. So that takes me about six minutes, just under six minutes. Um, and I'll do a, a swim run. The new thing I've kind of uh, dabbled in is this sport called swim running, which I don't know if you guys have heard. It's big over. It's really getting big in the UK now. Um, and it's big in Scandinavia as well. That's where it was born. Have you heard of that? I haven't actually, no. I mean, I can assume what it is, but I don't want to. I'd rather you explain but it. <laughs> swim run, and and if, if you Google it, it's one of the fastest growing kind of endurance sports. But it is basically um, a combination of swimming and running in multiple stages. So most of the big events will have anywhere from, let's say, 12 running stages and 11 swimming stages. They're always either, you know, the, the same because you're going from run to swim to run to swim and you're doing the entire thing without transition in the sense that you're running in your wetsuit and you're swimming in your shoes. Um, and it's a team sport. And so you're always with a partner who you can tow on the run with, you know, elastic bands or, or whatever, and you have to navigate the course together. So it's quite, um, it's quite a challenge. And a lot of these endurance athletes, multi-sport athletes, triathletes are, are moving towards this kind of as a new challenge. Um, and, and so that's, that's something that because it just involves running and swimming and it's easy and I can do it. I live right on a lake. Um, so getting back to my workout, that's my other workout. I have a short swim run that just runs down to the lake, swims 400 meters and runs back home, um, short and sharp. And that takes about 15 minutes. And then I do, uh, um, a couple of, um, CTL based continuous tension lifting, um, workouts that take, you know, three or four minutes. And then I do a hang workout cause I'm still hanging on to my climbing proficiency from, you know, another life. Um, where I just use a fingerboard and, and so that's it. That's my, that's my base workout. Um, I love it. and yeah, it takes about 30 minutes, give or take. So, so CTL, what does that stand for? Continuous tension loading. Well, so, yeah. You I, I'm, you, you've talked to, um, um, I know you've had conversations with, um, Doug McGuff and, yep. uh, he's the guy that, um, I first ran across that, um, looking at his body by science stuff, but basically it's what he does for his, um, I can't remember what his program is called. He has a name for it, but I've abbreviated CTL. That's what I heard somewhere, but it's where you're doing, um, super slow reps. So what I do for that is I just do body weight movements cause I don't have access to equipment. Mm-hmm. So I have a pull up bar. And so I will do, um, I have, um, uh, a little f- app on my phone, which is a, a hit time, you know, high intensity training app that can give me intervals. And so I set it to a four second um, work interval and a four second rest interval. And so I will do my eccentric motion or concentric motion where I'm pulling up to the bar over four seconds and slow, like no, um, no hanging and no um, locking off. So the muscles are under constant tension. And so you go four seconds up, four seconds down and repeat as many times as you can. Um, and so you're basically, your muscles are under load for the entire duration. So right now I'm doing about, um, I'm doing 10 reps at, um, four seconds up, four seconds down. So it's 80 seconds of continuous muscle tension, um, for the, the workout. And I do that for pull-ups or chin-ups, depending on the day. And then, um, some variation of push-ups. and that's, that's my upper body strength training and that's it. So I do that a couple times a week. And the app that you mentioned, there, do you know what the app's called? That sounds interesting. Um, I think it's called. Um, I I can get you the details. You can stick it on here. Um, it's called Hit Trainer. I just don't have my phone cool. in the room, and my kids are going crazy in the other room, getting ready for school. So I'll keep the door closed. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, if you don't mind, you could ping me an email over, perhaps with that for the show notes. That would be useful. Um, if I can't find it, that is. Um, yeah. Does that provide like some sort of a metronome, like a sound for each second so that you get it right? Mm. Uh, um, and it, it, the way I've got it set up and the one I've got doesn't provide a sound for every second, but it does provide um, a sound 
for the last three seconds before you transition. So a lot of times it will be used for um, Tabata type stuff. You know, you can use it for that. Um, and so it'll give you a, you know, three, two, one, rest, three, two, one, go. Um, and I've, I've just found that with a four, with a four second, um, you know, uh, pull up, it doesn't really matter because the first second there's nothing. And then it goes three, two, one, go. So you always kind of know where you're at and four seconds. You can't, you're not screwing up too much. Nice. Um, so that's, um, yeah, I use that quite a bit just because it keeps me honest in my rep length when I'm doing that. Um, and as far as the CTLs go, I, I've just, I love them because I find that I can consistently get much closer to, um, failure in, in a short amount of time. And, and often what I'll do is if I'm feeling strong that day, when I get done with my 10 reps, if I still have any in the tank, I'll just do as many, you know, just add on as many as I can. Um, to the end, which is usually not very many because you're pretty tired after that long. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's again, it's what I came across. Uh, other people have talked about it in different ways, but I kind of was first introduced to it with body by science. And it's really changed um, the way that I look at strength training because I'm not looking to I know a lot of your listeners and stuff are, are in that phase where they're still trying to get stronger and whatnot, but I'm, I'm, you know, 42, I've been into fitness for a, a fair while and, you know, I could do a lot of pull-ups and a lot of push-ups and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. So there's a point at which, and this is something I'd love to talk about as well, this idea of maintenance versus growth. And I'm, I'm, cl I'm definitely in a maintenance phase. It's a very high level maintenance phase, but it's definitely in a maintenance phase. And it's awesome to be able to to put as as little effort time wise into my week and still have such a high level of fitness, and that's really where my focus is now. Nice, yeah, it's a great place to be, and I I really enjoy listening to you talk about that with Brandon um, over on his podcast, which is the Desk Bound yeah. Podcast, and I do encourage the listeners to check your episode out on there too, and I'll put it in the show notes. Um, and you talked at length about you know this idea that. You know, you're very, you're quite happy at the plateau, you're quite happy maintaining a high level of strength for you. And, you know, but the, one of the problems we have at the moment is even some of the most, um, uh, you know, um, successful athletes are always looking for that new program to try and, you know, eke out some additional quote unquote gains in performance or strength or muscle mass or whatever it is. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, especially when people have been training for a, a long enough period of time, um, you know, the gains for muscle growth, for instance, come very, very slow. You're talking like a pound a year if that's what you care about. And, uh, and I really, I really found it quite, um, uh, sort of liberating and inspiring that you were just so content, uh, at this stage of your training, you're not, you're kind of appreciating the maintenance phase, you know? Um, and, 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 and grateful that you, like you say, that you can put in such little time and, and just destroy yourself <laughs> to, to maintain that level of fitness, which is pretty cool. And um, I mean, it's, I've, it's, it's one of those things that it's just over years. And, and I kind of came to the realization, um, more through multi-sport and realizing, okay, you know, I wanted to be a good paddler and runner and biker and, and swimmer and climber. And as I pushed harder to eke out, like you say, a little bit more gains in say swimming, I would always notice, okay, what, what's happening now is I'm becoming a less um, efficient or less fit runner. Right. And so um, over time, I kind of under, started to understand, look, there's, there's a limit as a person with all the other responsibilities um, and things that I want to do in my life that there, there's kind of – I can't just keep getting – like progress, this idea that we have of, of continual progress is in, in many ways a very real myth. You know, I cannot just keep becoming a better athlete in all of the areas that I want to excel in. It, it, I can't. There's always um, trade-offs, right? Yeah, there's always trade-offs, um, and and when you when you enlarge that a little bit, you know, and and take in not just the fitness aspect of it, but the life aspect of it, it's the same thing, you know. If if I want to actually be able to maintain, you know, even from a high intensity standpoint, if you're looking at exhaustion. If you're trying to fit, you know, there's a limit to high intensity what you can do, right, and really get motivated to do it. 
Um, and so there's always that trade off. You're spending less time with your family. You're, you're spending less time on your business. Um, and you know, there's a point at which if you're fit, right. And if you're, if you're able to do what you want to do, and that's what it's come down to for me is, can I do what I want to do? And really taking the time to define what I want to be able to do and not just pinning what I want to be able to do as, as, as some, um, progression towards, um, something that is, is relatively meaningless. You know, like I just want to get stronger. Well, yeah, but why? Right. And whenever I answered the why and I said, what do I want to be able to do? I found, Hey, you know, I don't need to be able to do 30 pull-ups. I can do 25 pull-ups and that's all I need to be able to do for what I want to do. So it's, uh, it's really interesting hearing you talk about the change to your lifestyle. Um, since we spoke, um, or, or that, you know, around that time when you moved from uh, North Dakota to New Zealand, uh, you know, I, as you might know, I moved from London, which I know is probably quite different to Dakota, um, right. to, uh, Galway in Ireland, but I, a bit similar situation in that I had, you know, my access to, you know, good training facilities and things like that, uh, was suddenly different. Um, and like you, I have, you know, incorporated a body weight routine and, um, kind of really fell in love with that and focused on mastering that. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just something I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about apps, the app you might be talking about, actually, I think you mentioned the name, but a similar app is Seconds. I think it's called Seconds, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. enables you to create custom timers. So I use those timers for things like, um, time static contraction for the neck. So if I'm doing mm -hmm. like neck extension or neck flexion on like a rolled up yoga mat on the floor, I can yep. use those custom timers. Is that the same app or is that a different app I'm thinking it, of? It's not, but I'm going to actually check out your app because mine um, is, I mean, it, it's it's the same idea. Basically, I yeah. can set in the number of seconds. It's, it's the same idea, yeah. yeah. So. You have to pay for it, which is the only downside. It's like one pound nine. Uh, yeah, one pound ninety nine. I don't know what that is, and well, two or three dollars, something like that. Um, but there, there probably is alternatives that are free that do the same function. Well, I, I, my, mine is free, but the downside is they've started having ads, you know, as they always do if it's free. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, it's, it's, it's. So we'll we'll give the free option and the pay option. People can <laughs> gotta monetize it somehow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know these are useful tools. Um, and, and also, you know, so our lifestyles are quite similar. You've kind of, um, you know, simplified and it uh, sounds like you've got very kind of rural surrounding and, uh, yeah. it's just cool to, to hear, to hear how you're kind of, I guess, coping with that change. Um, so in terms of the races, uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. I mean, you were, you know, before we got recording, you were talking about the God Zone race, which sounds yep. incredibly intimidating. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the last, um, the last big effort I did. Um, it was in March, um, mid March of this last year. And so, um, God zone is an expedition length adventure race and expedition, um, races are just in, generally anywhere from three to four days on. And this was a 10 day race. So basically the, the length of time teams had to complete the course was 10 days, um, and uh, for those listeners that aren't real familiar with adventure racing, adventure racing is a team sport where a team of four people uh, negotiates an a unknown course uh, together. And so unknown until the morning of the race where you get giant you know, maps that cover hundreds of kilometers. And then and you negotiate it much like a triathlon and changing from one discipline to another. Um, so there might be a trekking leg, um, for 40 kilometers and then you get on your bikes and there's a, a biking leg for 200 kilometers and then a paddling leg. And, um, and, and you don't, it's, there's no standard format. Every adventure race is different because the challenge is to actually navigate between checkpoints and route. Um, and it's, it's mostly wilderness setting. Um, so down, um, this, this race was held based in the very small town like i live in a town of 2000 people and it was this is where the race was based and this was the largest expedition adventure race um that the that's ever been held um in in the whole world i mean god's own new zealand is known for adventure racing and um the new zealand teams are some of the most competitive teams and then you had a hundred teams that showed up for this thing um which is the wow. biggest for a 10-day race they've ever had normally you know you got 20 30 teams um, 
And it was, you know, it was oh, the the creators. Of course, they always say it's going to be the hardest thing ever, but um, these guys are saying the same thing. And and I I know the terrain, so we did definitely had an advantage in the sense that I work um, in in what we call the bush in New Zealand. Um, and one of my teammates works in the bush as well, so we kind of knew how rough it was out there. Um, and we had we had a pretty brutal race. Um, we we did very well. We got we ended up in seventh place, which wow. for a, a rookie team, um, this was kind of our, our first time doing God Zone. Um, one of the guys had done it a couple times, but um, yeah, we we were um, all the, the t- teams that beat us. All of them had either won God Zone before or um, had a world championship racer leading the team. Um, so we felt we felt really good. And and at one point we were in third place. Um, and yeah, we're just this little local team from nowhere. Um, but it was, I got pretty beat up during the race. I ended up, um, on a third day, I ended up contracting trench foot and a lot of teams ended up getting trench foot. Um, and trench foot is just, you've probably heard of trench foot. I've heard Um, of it, but I don't know too much about it to be honest. Well, it's, it's, it's something that is very, um, rare these days. It was common in the wars because people are standing in trenches, which is where it got its common name from in cold water. They're just standing around and it's basically, it's almost a version of frostbite where not because of freezing conditions, but because of cold water conditions, um, the circulation, um, in your feet starts to deteriorate. Um, and then the skin eventually will start to kind of die and become necrotic. And, you know, it basically leads to frostbite type symptoms um, and nerve damage and stuff like that on the surface of your skin. And so a lot of people got this because we were constantly immersed in water. It's fjordland. It's very wet. We were paddling in pack rafts and just sitting in bathtubs full of water for hours while we paddling and, you know, wading through the forest. And, um, and, but for me, we were competitive. And so um, once I got that, I then got a foot fungus like an athlete's foot. And that that took all the flesh off my feet. Um, and then I got a bacterial infection on top of that. So by the Gosh. end of the race, um, by the last trekking leg, I was just I, – I was in absolute agony. And um, I mean it just – I was – impossible for me to to walk without um excruciating pain every step and it was just and and we're setting out on this 24 kilometer trek um through the mountains without trail this is just proper fjordland bush you know just hacking your way through thick growth fern and um and 24k of this up over mountain pass um and then we have a kayak leg to the finish and and we're sitting in seventh place at this time which is beyond our wildest ex- expectations and hopes in terms of placing and the rest of the team has no foot issues i mean they're they've got blisters and stuff but not not like me and so it was just i decided to try to keep going um because i didn't want to let the team down and you know you're stupid by 6 days without sleep um and and we made it, but it was just I was on um, massive doses of ibuprofen, and I was digging mentally to places that I'd like never gone. Um, and I was I was convincing myself that um, that I'd been born with a um, uh, you know malformed feet, and that I'd never walked without pain. And this was just to get you know another thirty steps, you know. So I was just like really getting primally into the pain, and that would work to to a certain point um and then it would stop working and i'd have to you know i'd just be screaming at the forest and oh it was just it was dark super dark Jesus, you're mental uh, mate <laughs> and, and like, i mean i i got I, I had to be carried across the finish line because by the time we got to the kayak and we had a long kayak section in but when i was in the kayak i had no pain in my feet and so my pain So I've learned a lot about pain threshold. So the pain threshold, when you're experiencing pain a lot, your pain threshold goes way up. Like it goes through the roof. It's a a survival mechanism, right? So your body's like, right, um, we're only going to pay attention to the most painful things that we need to. Um, And even then, every step, you know, every time my foot rolled and there was new flesh that was being torqued in the shoe, it was just, um, you know, it was was dropping me to my knees. Um, But when I stopped, the pain thresholds drop back down because I'm not putting any pressure on my feet. And then those first few steps, 
it's like I couldn't. I'd stand up to walk and you collapse. I mean, it's just on your feet, but you just. And so I was carried across the finish line, and um, doctors look at my looked at my feet, and I went right to the hospital. And I mean, it was ten days before I could walk, and um, they said I was one step away from skin grafts um, and gangrene. Um, oh, it's just, so it was, what about it amputation? Was, does that happen? Severe? It does happen, um, and that is so. Um, once gangrene sets in, yeah. if you don't catch gangrene, so there was a person on the race that was pulled from the course um, that did end up having, was in a medically induced coma for about three days. Um, and they ended up having full skin grafts on both their feet from their, you know, they took flesh from their upper thigh or their hamstring or something and, and put it on because it was so, the the necrotic damage was so deep. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, thankfully mine was a step shy of that. Um, but I mean, it was just, it was just epic. And it was, I wasn't the only one. There, there were a handful of other people that had it pretty bad. Most people slowed down and, you know, treated their feet, you know, got medical attention for their feet during the race, got um, antifungal stuff and, anti, and antibiotics during the race. But we were just pushing so hard that, you know, we'd get into a transition. And, and I was racing with my brother, who's a, a kind of a semi-pro racer. And he was like, man, we can't stop. We got to keep going. What do you need? <laughs> Get your pack on. Let's go. And it was just, I was reduced to tears a couple of times. It was just, yeah, it's brutal. I'll take my hat off to you. It's, uh, I, I think you're mental, but I also appreciate it and um, really admire your courage. Um, what would you do differently going into it next time to try and prevent this from happening if possible? Well, I was, I, and I thought a lot about that. I mean, I was, um, you know, I spent, spent two weeks basically on the couch with my feet up. And, um, one thing I would do is, you know, part of it's easy. It's just recognizing the signs. Like there was enough, um, that I could have picked up on. I had never had this, this foot fungus. So the, the, um, trench foot was one thing, but it was the combination of the three because the foot fungus basically then devoured all the, um, the dermal layer of my foot, like all that dead skin that kind of protects your foot on the outside, mm-hmm. that just ate that all away and it left nothing but raw flesh to then get infected. So, um, so, and, and a lot of racers have had that fungus before and know what it feels like. I hadn't. And so I assumed that it was, um, I assumed that it was just a self limiting thing, right? I didn't know what could happen after that. And so I'd been prepped a lot. Um, by my brother who's had really bad foot issues before about what's self-limiting and what's not. And I had kind of convinced myself that any foot issues I was going to have were self-limiting, meaning that it was just a matter of how tough I was and that they'd all, um, they'd all heal fine. You know, it's like blisters. You get a blister and it's going to hurt really badly, but you can push through and that blister is going to heal. Yeah. You know, you're going to get, it's going to bleed and it's going to be nasty, but two weeks later, the, the skin's going to heal. Um, and I've experienced that to some extent, but, um, you know, it, when, when you're faced with walking for another 36 hours and every step, you know, starts to hurt between your toes or whatever, it's kind of hard to do unless you develop that mentality. Um, and so that's what I went and I convinced myself, right, it's all going to be self-limiting. And then when we were, um, during the kind of the crucial situation, we were finding, we found ourselves in third place, you know, like, like shooting for the podium in this, in this is about halfway through the race. And we just made bad decisions. We just made lots of bad decisions because we were no longer racing our race. And, you know, a 10 day race, you can't actually be racing the people that you see in head of you, ahead of you, or you think are catching you because it's a 10 day race. Like yeah. you don't know how much they've slept versus how much you've slept. You just don't know any of that stuff. And that's what we started doing. You know, at one point we, a team caught us on the bike or we saw them, um, you know, we saw them behind us and we just stopped navigating and we just rode like hell and got lost for six hours. You know, we started making bad decisions like that and pushing on when nobody could function. You know, at night we were just babbling to each other and, and we have a girl on our team. You have to have a, a girl on the team and, um, you know, she has a, a, they have a one-year-old. It was my brother's wife. And then, you know, she was just breaking down mentally, like in the middle of the night, just saying she wanted to die and that, you know, she'd wanted to go back to Max, which is the son. And it was just like, it was chaos. It was, it was, it's such a crazy 
type of race. Um, it's just everything falls apart and then you put it back together and it falls apart again. It's just, it's madness. It really is. Sounds immensely so. tactical. Like fitness is one thing and willpower and all the stuff you mentioned just now, but it sounds very fascinating because you, you clearly have to, to plan as well as you can and, uh, you know, have a skill set around orienteering and, um, yeah. all these other things. And I mean, it, it's, it's one of the, it's, it's one of the ways I really fell in love with um, high intensity training because, like th- this, this stuff is kind of the um, the penultimate type of endurance stuff, you know, um, because it incorporates um, a triath- triathlon like intensity during the first day. Like the first day when you're fresh, if you want to be competitive in these races, you have to, to just to race like hell, just like o- off the line. It's like you're doing a six hour race. That's how fast you're going. Right after the first day, everything changes, and it's completely a mental battle. Your fitness, like your actual physical fitness, matters so much less because you've been going for a day, right? You can't you can't train to perform um, at at your peak for more than a day. It's it's ridiculous, right? So it just is. You're slowing down. You're eating more. You know your heart rate's not you know n- no more than fifty sixty percent. Um, but you're just pushing at that level and you're dealing with sleep deprivation and team dynamics and, and, you know, hunger and, and feet and all that sort of stuff. So it is, it's just, just in, in a few days, you're getting this, this, um, massively kind of, um, vital experience in all these different areas. Yeah. It's a, it's a cool, it's not for everybody, mind you, but <laughs> how did you feel at the end? Mm. Oh man, I was weeping at the end. I was just, um, partly out of, um, out of joy at being done, you know, the relief, um, partly, you know, seeing my wife and my kids. Um, and yeah, like my wife hugged me and then she was super mad at me. She was yelling at me at the same time because she knew my feet were bad because she'd got been getting reports from some of the <laughs> videographers out there, you know, like they showed pictures of my feet and it looked like <laughs> a zombie. I looked like a zombie from the ankle down. It was just, it was, um, yeah. So it was just, it was, it's hard to describe that. It's, it's like, um, and, and without being pretentious, you know, it's like being rescued in a sense, you know, are you self rescuing, but imagine like a disaster movie where you crash in, in, you know, on a plane in the middle of the wilderness and, and you finally either get rescued or you've hiked down the mountain for days. I mean, it, you, that's mentally you go into, that place it's all uh, um it's all self-motivated i mean it, it, it's silly to think that that we do this to ourselves willingly and any point you know you have a, a safety beacon or whatever you could push the button you can say right this is ridiculous you know i don't need this i've got i've got kids and, and a job and and a lot of more important things but to be successful you for whatever reason you you willingly go there and when you do that it it becomes not an option, if that makes sense. I mean, the only way to get through that, if you think it's an option, yeah, I can, I can stop and my feet will be fine, or I can keep going and I can be in excruciating pain for another day and a half. Nobody chooses that unless they've decided that somehow um, it, it, it means something. And the easiest way to do that is to kind of compare it to that survival situation. Like, I have to get through this. I don't have another option. And so you get that similar sense of relief and you're overcome with emotion and, um, yeah, I mean, just will the finish line videos of other teams coming in after us, um, you know, were all, especially the ones that had pushed and got to that point where they had that sort of um, epic journey. It was it was all the same, just weeping and crying and um, hugging as if they'd just been, yeah, rescued from some horrible ordeal. Yeah. You know, last time we spoke, um, we discussed the, you know, the benefits of these types of events. Um, clearly, there's enormous short-term consequences, health consequences. You know, you were, your immune system was pretty, uh, pretty down when we were talking. Um, and yet, you, you know, we talked about how grateful you are for the simple things in life, you know, for, for, I think at the time you were, you know, I think you just, you just moved to New Zealand, hadn't you? You were in a cottage, you, you barely had, you know, the internet connection and, uh, and you were talking about how when you go through these types of events, you're, uh, enormously grateful for, you know, very, very simple things in life, which is, you know, such a powerful place to be something I try and cultivate. Talk to me more about like 
the upsides? I mean, maybe it's just more of the same, but what, what, how do you think this, that type of event benefited your life? Well, so there's, there's, there's what we talked about before, which is, yeah, um, you know, you, you feel, um, well, for me, one, I feel a little bit more content in the mundane, you know, after that race, I, I, I'm just now starting to think about, um, real adventures again. I've had a couple, um, you know, good adventures since then, but it was a long time before I really felt that, um, that itch, if you will, um, to go and, and to do something like that. So obviously there's, um, there's a bit of, of therapy in that if you get into this sort of thing. Um, it's the same thing with climbing mountains, you know? Um, but the other thing I think that I find valuable is, um, the sense of empowerment that, um, and even it's not just succeeding at something like that, but, but it's about pushing boundaries a little bit um, in that it, it makes you realize that even though you don't always live at those boundaries, that if it comes to it, like I like feeling capable and, and knowing that when things get hard, right, I will be able to um, knuckle down and figure out what needs to be done and, and see my way through it. And and that applies not just to an adventure race style situation, but you know lots of situations. If if um, you know if my kids got sick, if um, if uh, we had financial issues, all those sorts of stresses, you know, I, I feel more confident managing um, because of the amount of stress that that in in some of these events. I deal with because a lot in, in these events, a lot of times it is, it's, it's not just the physical stress. There's definitely that physical stress, but it's also, you know, other things that, that translate, um, somewhat more directly to life. You know, it's, it's the, the team dynamics, if you will, is, you know, like interpersonal relationships, like understanding that you're all on the same page, even when you're yelling at each other and somebody wants to quit and somebody, you know, and, and you, you have all this stuff that you're dealing with and you have to say, look, okay, you know, how do we manage this? And so having the confidence to do that in, in this grim situation where you are as stressed and sleep deprived and whatever is possible, you know, that gives you something to look back on when you're, you know, when you're sitting and you're having a disagreement with your spouse or something like that. And you say, like, okay, we can figure this out because right now, at least we can walk, you know, I've got a cup of coffee, you know, that, and, and so, you know, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't make life, um, non-difficult, but it, it kind of, for me, it kind of gives me a, a reservoir of experience, um, and hardship that, um, you know, there are other ways to get that in life. Um, but being, uh, you know, a a, a, a white, a white middle-class guy, you know, that that's not just coming to me in the act of living, like it does with a lot of people around the world where they're kind of developing that resilience. So resilience is a good word. That's kind of a popular word now, but, but that's kind of what it does is, is it's a, it's an artificial way of, um, cultivating a very robust resilience. Yeah. That, well said. And, um, yeah, I think resilience is the catch all for a lot of what you're saying. And I think that's a good word to use. You know, it reminds me, I, I, um, you know, it makes, it inspires me that maybe I should perhaps dip a toe in the water in, in a similar kind of event, maybe not God's own, maybe start smaller. Um, but, you know, I have done obviously obstacle races and things like that in the yeah. past. Um, you know, and, and the reason I say that is I really, um, you know, something that really resonated with me, uh, which you said there was just, you know, how it makes, yeah, like you see, you have a reservoir from which to pull from, you have more resilience when coping with day to day life. Um, you know, it, if I notice myself getting stressed out because I can't get my printer to work, you know, that's, that's probably something that shouldn't stress me out, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I just kind of occurred to me there that, you know, I, I'm thinking, putting myself in your shoes. Do you ever have a challenge in your day and you go, well, you know what? It's not as bad as that time I got trench foot. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll be using that for a while. I mean, it's definitely, it's, um, and I, I definitely hope never to get it again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and it's, it's hard to always do that. Right. It's, but, um, so for me, it's, it's a bit more, um, it's a bit more in the background, you know, it's just, and, and I've had quite a few experiences in my life similar to that, not with trench foot, but just with other 
moments that um, that when they all add up um, make me fairly. I guess I look at it, it makes me confident in my ability to deal with uncertainty. So that's another way of looking at that resilience. But, you know, I like adventure racing in particular because you're going out there and you're willfully going into a situation for 10 days where you don't know what the variables are going to be. Like I never would have expected to get, you know, um, trench foot and to have it be the most excruciating thing I've ever felt and have to deal with that for four days. I, I never would have expected that. I mean, you're expecting sore knees and fatigue and all that kind of stuff. But even then, you don't know when that's going to happen. You don't know who, whether you're going to crash on your bike, whether you're going to get lost. You don't know any of that stuff. So um, dealing with uncertainty and that so that's kind of, uh, you know, getting back to life. Life is always going to be uncertain, right? Even when we, everything's going well and you know, the job's going well, the house going well, the kids are doing well in school. At some point, something's going to happen and you're going to have a hiccup. There's going to be an accident. There's going to be somebody that you, you love that gets sick, you know, or um, you're going to get fired for whatever reason, you know. And, and when that happens, you have this huge degree of uncertainty. And so it's it's practice dealing with uncertainty. So that's for me what these big events are, is practice dealing with uncertainty and then reacting to uncertainty um, in positive ways that that move towards the goal because you know it's and even being comfortable with failure right because sometimes it doesn't work and like big i've done a, a number of big races and i haven't finished and i haven't you know been successful and that's another good lesson you know just putting yourself out there and realizing you know it's never the end right you just you, you do something else you move on so yeah and um i also think you know, I guess a uh, another way of developing resilience um, in in the context we're talking about is, you know, uh, you know that what you said there and being able to embrace uncertainty uh, dovetails quite nicely into you know stoicism. Um, and you know, for people that you know, perhaps they're listening to you talk about God's own, and they're like, yeah, not for me. You know, I do really encourage you to to. Uh, consider looking into Stoic philosophy uh, and Letters from a Stoic from Seneca is very, very good and um, definitely got me thinking about how, you know, how there's a lot of things in life you just do not control. And the sooner Absolutely. you can come to accept that, the better off your quality of life is. Um, so no, I, I, I agree completely. Um, so one thing I just wanted to, I guess, just know, um, you know, uh, hearing you talk about, you know, your, your position in that race, I mean, your team finished seventh, you know, you had a rookie team, as you said there, you train for 30 minutes a week, you know, um, there's so many people out there that will not believe that. Um, but it's just, you know, science is there to support that you can, you can exercise really intensely in short periods of time, um, and, you know, stimulate the same improvements and adaptations that you can doing more volume uh, in both, you know, from a, a cardiovascular and, uh, you know, uh, muscular performance point of view. Um, what, what do people say? You know, I mean, do you talk to your fellow racers and competition about your training regimen? Is it still like night and day when you compare regimens? Um, it, it is. Um, and, and I want to, um, I, I want to uh, go back to a couple things you said because, yeah. um, um, and, and, and so just to clarify, so the 30 minutes is, and, and I, I carry that. And I like when God's own was approaching, I, I kept thinking, right, this is a really big event. It's a team event. So I'm going to have to start, um, training harder, um, leading up to it. So initially my plan, cause the race was in March. Initially my plan was okay. Um, in October, you know, I'm going to give myself five months in October. I'm going to start ramping up the volume. So October came and went and I didn't. November came and went and I didn't. December it was Christmas. I didn't. So I was still hitting it hard and doing my high intensity stuff. Um, and in mid January, um, the rest of the team arrived. My brother and, and sister in law came over. Um, and the other guy was already living here. And so I did do, um, with the team, when the team got here, we put together a few, um, missions from my house where we did longer stuff. And it was, it was team training. It was navigation practice in the bush. So I did probably four or five things that ranged from, you know, an hour and a half, um, to three hours. And these were not high intensity, but they also weren't, they, they weren't race pace. It was just basically going out and practicing pack rafting and transitions and stuff like that. And so, you know, it, it's, I, I would not have taken on a 10 day race, 
Um, I mean, I would have if I wasn't, if other people weren't relying on me, if that makes sense. It does. And I'm not sure what difference it would have been. But so my base fitness, right? And, and so this is, you know, this is where I'm at right now is my base fitness is, is 30 minutes a week. And, um, even, even though I did longer stuff, you know, I'm looking at, um, five, five training sessions, um, leading up to a 10 day race. And if you compare that to what most people are doing, they're training for a year for this thing, which is typical. And their, you know, their weekly volume is, um, especially the last few months is 10 to 20 hours. Um, where they're doing massive things. So, um, so I just, I just want to, you know, make that, that clear. Um, you know, so I think there, there is something to, and that's what I'll often do. I'll often, this is my base volume. And then, um, depending upon how serious I am about, um, about the event, and I'll give an example. The next thing I'm going to do is there's a, a trail called the Dusky Trail down here. That's an 88 kilometer trail that's never been run in a day because it's so, um, it's so grueling. And so I've organized uh, an informal event that runs the dusky trail and there's going to be 50 odd people that are going to go and try to run it in a day. And I'm going to be among them. And I will probably the four weeks before that, I will ramp up my running to where I'm doing maybe a 5k and, you know, a 10k. And then my, my top end run will probably be around 15k. So I will do probably four or five longer runs leading up to that. Um, because, you know, my, although my, my plateau is very high, if I want to do well in an 80 kilometer run and all I've done for the last year is run a mile, right. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty easy. It doesn't take a lot of time or extra effort to significantly improve my chance um, at doing well over that distance. So, um, you know, it's not, and I, you know, it's not like you can just run a mile and then you can go, go run. Uh, I could, like I could, I could walk out the door and run a half marathon. No question. Right. Even running a mile for a year because I have that mental toughness and, um, the fitness you can get off that mile mm -hmm. is pretty good if you're running it fast. Right. But, um, if I wanted to have my best half marathon time ever, it would do me a lot of good to go for four weeks and to actually ramp that up a little bit just so that you, you know what it feels like. You're not going to have the fatigue as early, but I still think that's a very significant thing because most people shy away from endurance, as you know, because if you look at any endurance training program out there, right, it's going to commit you to, you know, uh, five months of, um, of three hours a week of running at minimum. And that's a low volume program, yeah. right? Um, okay. So, um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember. I just because I just wanted to make that clear. No, so that I, let, let yeah. me just let me just interject for a second, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of the question. <laughs> but no, um, I, I think that's an important thing, and appreciate you being transparent because um, I, I agree. I mean, you mentioned this with Brandon. Um, you know, uh, doing doing you know thirty minutes an hour high intensity based stuff once a week is not optimal for these types of races. Clearly, um, it's just. Uh, you know, it's it's just going to give you that good baseline level of fitness, um, and then obviously to to optimize for the races, then you obviously need to, as you say, train specifically or as close to race conditions as possible without overtraining or wearing yourself out, um, so that you can, uh, you know, train that skill and then be more efficient on the day. Um, so yeah, I totally completely agree with that. And I'm, I'm not in the camp that's saying, well, I don't know if this people are saying this, but I don't for a moment think you could get away with, you know, for 30 minutes an hour a week uh, and expect to finish first on one of these major races. Um, but no, the original question was just, um, you know, how do people, you know, after God's zone, I mean, clearly you, you, you had some ramping up prior to the, to the race, but you know, year prior, you were mostly doing 30 minutes an hour a week. So did you have conversations about your training regimen with people? And I, I'd love to hear the type of reactions you get. Well, um, it's it's been different here. Um, I did um, when I first came, and I don't know if this is before or after our, our first podcast, but I did train a guy locally for a, um, uh, a mountain run using um, a one hour a week program. Um, and d did we talk about that before? I did. I'm just going to bring it up so I can remember his name. I'm yeah. sure you probably remember. Uh, Vaughn. Vaughn Filmer is still, still a good friend of mine. Um, and, and I, you know, it's 
to be fair, it's a small town and there is, um, there's another athlete in town, um, who is a top mountain runner, um, uh, a local cop who is just, um, full on into mountain running. He's made the master's team, um, worldwide and he's basically, um, our little, um, poster child for athleticism and he trains exactly the opposite of me. You know, so he's, he's got a coach and he's out there running. All he does is run, you know, but he's out there running. God knows how much, you know, six, seven hours a week. Um, and, and he loves it and he's very successful. And, and so it's been interesting. Um, he gets a lot, he's, he loves press. So he gets a lot of press. Um, and he's very, he's very, um, outspoken about his training methods. And so what I have found is that I've just kind of, um, I've kept a little more quiet here. I'm still working on some stuff, um, for publication at some point. It's kind of a slow process with a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but I have found that in New Zealand in general, there is a very, um, strong culture of doing heaps of volume. Um, and, I don't know if there's just a different, um, uh, different approach towards athleticism. There are a lot, a lot of fitter people, especially down where I live. Um, the number of fit people down here is, um, is, is awesome. And there's just heaps and heaps of people, even people that you, you, you know, the, the guy that runs a pharmacy, the person that is bagging groceries, you know, they're all out doing, um, their own little thing. Um, and so I, I just, there's some people that are definitely interested in it. And I have talked, I did talk to people in God's zone, but man, it's, I'm more than ever. I'm really, um, very different because people are willing and interested in just putting heaps of time into it. these guys that we were competing against. I mean, it makes me feel pretty good because there's, um, there's a lot of people that I came into contact with leading up to God's zone, for example, that are posting their they're training on Facebook and, you know, their team's got Facebook pages so you can follow along and they're just, they're running up mountains every weekend and they're just pushing, pushing, pushing. And the number of teams that were aiming for the top 10 in this race was, was staggering. It was like 30 or 40 teams that thought they were going to get in the top 10. And I was starting to get scared before God's zone because I'm looking at these teams and what these, what the athletes are doing. And I'm just like, holy shit, they're just all going to crush me because they're just, (laughs) you know, they're running marathons in preparation and having all these training races that are these six hour races. And they're just, and I'm looking at their thighs on their Facebook picture and I think, Oh my God. And then, you know, as it turns out, you go out there and for something like this, and we were just right out in the front, like from the very beginning, we just were, there's a great picture. Um, I can send it to you if you want, but where we're, um, the we're leading out the the start the race starts with the run through town to a transition area where we had to blow up our pack rafts which are these inflatable kind of kayakly things and and paddle away and um you know we're running down and there was a there was a period when I'm leading you know I get it's just blaze because I'm I'm used to doing everything fast right so I just blaze right to the front and my team's trying to catch up with me and I'm just just hauling down the main street and there's this big spread of people behind me <laughs> um and I mean you know it's just and we just kept that pace like that first day. It was just even these guys that – and I, I don't know if it's because they do so much and they're used to going – I don't know what it is, but we just were really thrilled. Um, yeah, we didn't feel like that that even seventh, we didn't feel like we got beat by fitness. It was experience, you know, and the teams that had done these races for, for two decades um, that came out in front of us. So it was, it's, it was great. Like it was such a confidence booster to finish this race and have as many problems as I did where we were, you know, moving at a crawl the last two and a half days and we still were out in front. We still managed seventh. So it was pretty, it was pretty cool. So I, it basically renewed my confidence, even though I haven't won a huge following over here, you know, um, it definitely renewed my confidence to keep doing what I'm doing and, and, you know, using my time, how I'm using it, because it's not, it's not keeping me from doing anything at the level I want to do it. So, Yeah, absolutely. A lot of quiet champions. Well, not obviously seventh isn't champions, but it's champions in, in this context from what you're saying. Uh, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, um, uh, the, the top U S team, you know, the, these guys are, are semi-pro adventure races. They're doing races all over the world. They came over and, 
and they got 11th, you know? So it's, awesome. it, it was, yeah, I think we were the first, well, we were a mixed team, half New Zealand, but technically I guess I'm, I'm not really a Kiwi. Not, not yet. I've only been here four years. Well, you say that, but you did say the word heaps about 16 times just now. You, you, it it yeah. sounds like you've picked that up from, uh, from I, living there. I, is I that right? <laughs> Absolutely, I picked up the vernacular, yeah. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta blend in, Lawrence. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting-edge, high-intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance both positively and negatively, 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Really, absolutely cool. Um, now, that's, um, that's very interesting. So is it like, you know, at the beginning where you're leading the pack and you're sprinting and you're going fast, is that like first hour or two, like really enjoyable? And then it's just downhill from there. Because then that, you know, you've... You've uh, you really started to feel the the, the strain. Uh, maybe it's not two hours. Maybe it's more like you know the first half of the day or something. But is it like that? Is it really kind of feel good to begin with, and then then it's just tough. So for me, for me, it's it's the opposite because the first and this this race was interesting in that there were a lot of races are continuous, and this one because of river sections there was um, what they call um, dark zones. So there was only a certain part of the course that was open the first day. And most of the top teams finished that part and had about four hours of sleep that first night because of a, of a, a release on a river, a, a water release on a river. Um, and so the second day kind of had a mass start again for the top teams. And then the same thing happened on the third day. There was another mass start because there was a big whitewater river that was closed until first light. And so, so we basically had three starts with the top teams. A lot of the teams were back. So by then you only got 20 or 30 teams. Um, and I hate that because, um, those fast times, that is the hardest, right? Because it's like, you're trying to, to be competitive in any sort of shorter distance race. That's when your heart rate is 180 and you're tasting the blood in the back of your mouth. And you just, you start to have doubts. You think I can't keep this pace up 
for very long. And so for us, it's that first, the first six hours I can remember is where you just dig a hole, right? And so, I mean, we were starting to fail after about six hours, but other teams were too, because you push so hard. You know, it's, imagine like you, you run an ultra marathon, a, a, you know, a 50K race after six hours, man, you're, you're getting cramping in your legs and all that kind of stuff. So that's, it's fun in the sense that you're racing and you've got all that pent up energy and you just get to go. But man, you know, paddling at, at 90% across a lake, it gets, you're not, you're not enjoying it. You know, that if you want to be competitive in those races, you are at the front of the field and you're pushing with everything you have. Um, and if you're feeling good because your teammates are slower, then you're carrying their pack. Like I carried two packs for a while when my brother was hurting. Um, I was towing somebody, you know, an elastic band. So I'm towing somebody up a hill and then I started bonking, you know? And so it just, I felt like it's going to throw up climbing this mountain. No, it was, it was, it's, it's awesome, but man, it's, it's not enjoyable at the beginning. It's much more enjoyable as you slow down. Um, and everybody slows down. Yeah. So it starts tough. You know, I, I remember um, listening to uh, some experts talking about the, the the negative effects of something like a Tour de France um, yeah. in how, you know, the amount of muscle mass that the athletes lose uh, during the race. Uh, and I'm sure there are other uh, downsides to health, um, at least temporarily. You know, do you find that type of impact on or after a race like this? Do you, do you, do you feel like you lose muscle mass and... I know that you probably you take a massive hit to your immune system, but do you feel you lose things like muscle mass as well? Um, I, I do. Absolutely. You lose muscle mass um, and you just lose, you lose fitness in general. Um, and, you know, whether it's immune system or whatever, it took probably even once my feet were healed. Um, and like, I've got a good metric that maybe a lot of people that don't do high intensity training don't have because, you know, I've got a mild time trial right at my door. And if I'm not able to go, you know, my normal time is 545, roughly, roughly, you know, give or take 10 seconds. And if I'm not able to do that, then I know that something's off, you know. Um, and I think when I tried to go back to running after about seven weeks post-race, you know, I was up at 615, 620, and I felt like I was pushing as hard as I could. So seven weeks out from the race, I still had not recovered to the point where I could have the muscle recruitment um, and the auction, you know, recruitment, yeah. whatever, um, to be able to perform at the level I was able to perform, um, you know, in my maintenance phase before the race. Um, so that's that's fairly significant, you know. I mean, seven weeks is a long time for the body to heal, and I still had, you know, I think it was about nine weeks before I was able to to go under six. Um, so mm. yeah, it, it just you know, it was, it was, it was take, you know, it took its toll for sure. Um, yeah, so it's, and the immune system is a big thing. Obviously you just get sick after a race like that. Um, and what's funny is that, um, in the race itself, things usually clear up if that makes sense. So like I started races with colds, um, and you know, even flu like symptoms and generally during the race, and I don't know if there's any science behind this or if it's just coincidence, but it seems like your body kind of says right and redoubles some effort because it knows what's happening and and fixes all that stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm talking on my ass, but um, same same thing happens when you drink a lot of alcohol. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not yeah. saying that to take the mic, but um, I find whenever I've had a cold and then I've gone and got drunk, I the cold disappears. But then you wake up in the morning and it's like ten times worse. Yeah, so so that this is yeah, so adventure racing is like alcohol, right? It's, it's, yeah, so it's the same thing, right? Yeah, your body's like, oh, right, I better I better shape up here, and then and then yeah, let you have it the next morning. Um, so that's you know that's um, that's kind of what I've experienced, but um, yeah. Very interesting. So, did you um did you take note of like how much muscle mass you lost, like how much weight you lost after the race um, or after races? Like when when I I, I couldn't. When I finished, um, even lowering my feet below my heart um, was excruciatingly painful because I had nerve damage all the way in my feet. And so anytime the blood rushed down there, um, it, it felt like, um, you know, the worst, um, you know, what hot aches are, 
Have you heard of hot aches? Uh, it's like possibly. Go on. Hot aches or even like pins and needles, like really bad pins and needles. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Um, so anytime my feet were you know, below my heart, like I'd, I'd stand up and use crutches to go to the toilet or whatever, it was just – I'd have about 30 seconds and then the pain was almost unbearable. So, and this was, this was for a week afterwards. So I did not, um, I didn't stand on a scale <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I was emaciated. Like I was, I was, I, I, I looked horrible. Um, and yeah. you know, a lot of it, like I, when I look at the pictures of the finish line, you can see that my cheekbones more prominently and like, you know, so that that's pretty pronounced. If you've, if your face has changed during the course of a race, you know, you've lost <laughs> I mean, it partially dehydration, but like we were drinking lots and we were trying to eat lots, but it's, it's a matter of how much you can, um, you can actually process, right? So you can, you just can't process enough calories to keep up with, with what you're doing out there. So, um, yeah, I, in, you know, so especially if you're pushing, um, slower teams will often not lose any weight because they're, they're just basically going on a hike for, for 10 days. Um, and yeah. they can often eat quite a bit, but if you're moving, you know, you just, you can't carry that much food. And so yeah, yeah it's probably on the order of, I'd say five kilograms. A lot of, a lot of people will lose during a race. Wow. A stone of weight, practically. I'm thinking about yeah. it for, for the, uh, the UK listeners who use a um, stone. Four, is it 14 pounds this time? Yeah. About 14 pounds. Yeah. But six kilos to a stone, 14 pounds. Uh, yeah. It's all, all the one. Um, I believe that's about right. So no, that's that is that's really interesting. I think that's one of the reasons why I don't want to do these things, <laughs> yeah. um, among others. But but uh, before we before we wrap up, Andy, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your lifestyle because um, it really fascinates me. Um, you know, your story is interesting in that you, for those that don't know, and they can listen to part one if they want more context. You know, you used to have a high volume training regimen, um, and then you realized that that wasn't really conducive to your your lifestyle, and you know, your relationship didn't take well to it, and your other responsibilities. Um, and you know, you've got a lot going on in your life. So, do you want to? Do you mind just talking about like what 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 are you up to these days? And are you still you were running a charity last time we spoke? So, what are you doing? What does an average day look like for you? Right. So, um, so yeah, since we last talked, there's been heaps of there's heaps again. Um, there's been a lot, <laughs> there's been a lot of changes. Um, and yeah, when I was in the States before I came to New Zealand, I'd started a, a, a nonprofit for youth adventuring. Um, and I also put on a bunch of endurance races. So that was kind of what I was doing back in the States coming over here. I've kind of switched gears. Um, I work for the department of conservation, which is kind of a, uh, well, it's the Department of Conservation, so they do a lot of stuff trying to preserve the wilderness and animal species and stuff. So I do that very, very on a contract basis. So uh, you know, maybe a couple days a week, um, a, a trip a month, something like that. So not a lot. I also um, am in a small business as a guide pack rafting, um, commercially and teaching pack rafting. And that's a, a seasonal, I have a lot of seasonal jobs to make it work over here. Um, and then I've also started, I, I can't let go of the endurance stuff. So I've started a sporting society over here called the Fear Society, which is the Fjordland Endurance and Adventure Racing Society. And we put on um, about five or six very grassroots, low key kind of club style um, events, but like big efforts, um, adventure races. And this, this next run I'm doing along the dusky track is part of that. Um, and it's, it's basically a nonprofit to get around some loopholes and be able to run races in the, in the national park. We had to be creative and, and kind of do it this way. But so, um, so that's kind of what's taking a lot of my time. I'm also learning to be a, a builder, um, just by building, um, my house here, which I'd never done before. And now I'm, I'm working on my brothers. He's just bought a house over in New Zealand. So he's, I'm, I'm building on that. Um, and just so, you know, every day is different for me. Um, and it's great. I mean, I like that because if, if there's, if I'm doing something that I don't like, if I'm, you know, out in the field, uh, working in the rain and, and being miserable for a few days, then I know I get to go back and I don't have to do that for a while. Um, so, um, it's, it's good. And, and what I've, what I like about the high intensity training as, and where it dovetails into that is that, um, my commitment to training in order to kind of preserve the type of fitness that I, I, 
enjoy and, and want to keep enjoying is so limited um, that I have this kind of thing, um, this rule, you know, if it's going to be beyond that 30 minutes a week, then it needs to what I call tick another box. So besides just the training box, like training for me is right. This is the time I'm going to spend exclusively to maintain my level of strength or endurance or speed. Like that's the only goal of training for me. There's no other goal, right? So if it ticks another box, then for me, I, I don't necessarily think about it as training. And, and I don't need to, um, to fit that into my schedule. I can or I cannot. So for example, uh, last week, my wife wanted to go for a bike ride because she also does her own you know, fitness stuff. And so she said, hey, you want to come? I wasn't working that day. So I said, why not? So it's just an easy half an hour bike ride. Um, and, um, or with my kids, you know, if my kids, um, are doing something, I'll go climbing at the little rock wall with my kids cause they're under climbing now, you know, go for a family walk. Um, the other thing, occasionally I get jobs where I'm out in the field and I actually have to hike for eight hours on trails. And so that's good because that keeps me fit, right? I, I like doing stuff like that. You're out in nature, but I'm getting paid 300 bucks for that day. So that's ticking another box. So for me, it, it's, I look at the training as saying, hey, you know, this is what I need to do at a minimum to maintain what is important to me um, in terms of my physical potential. And it's awesome to have that be almost non-existent in, in the time scale of a week. Um, and, and it's perfect because then whatever else I want to do, um, you know, if we want to go on vacation, if we want to do any number of things, it's so easy to fit that in. Um, and I never really think about training. I don't, I really don't think about training as an aspect of something that I have to get done, which is cool. Yeah. It sounds like you've got a really wonderful lifestyle. Um, I really like it's re the, the life you've crafted for yourself is really cool. Um, you know, like you say, if you're not training, you're doing a lot of active, your jobs are very active. You know, you're not sat in front of a, a laptop all the time. Um, which is, which I is, I do a fair bit of that, but uh, you know, it's like, cause I also like, I started writing some fiction. Right. Um, all right. and so, yeah, when it's raining, you know, I'm not going outside if it's raining, if I can help it. I'm going to sit in front and have a second cup of coffee and, and, and yeah, you know, work on the, the book that I'm writing. So, um, but yeah, but it's varied. It's, it's like I said, it's varied. So if, if, you know, I'll have a, a week where I'm basically doing a lot of computer work and then just the high intensity stuff. And then I'll, I'll get a job where I need to be out in the field for a couple of days. So, um, they, I'm always a little sore after those if I'm not doing it very often, but it's, it's fine. You know, I, and I find that the, the I find that the training allows me to, in, 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 to manage that. And so that's always for me, you know, it's like if I can, uh, train for 30 minutes a week and then when I'm called to go and spend six days on an Island, you know, walking up mountains every day, if I don't have to worry about that transition, I mean, how awesome of a training program is that? I mean, that's, that's cool. You know, like most people would need to train a month before they go to the island so that they could cope with that. But I don't. And so it's great. It's, it's what I need. Cool. Do you have any, um, actually before I ask that question, how, how is the, the ultra mental, um, business side doing? Have you managed to sell many books? Has that really picked up much that, because I thought um, that was a great ebook you wrote. It's, it's ticking along. Um, and you know, um, I'm, I'm, still steadily selling books. I, I revamped and, and changed the cover um, <laughs> and, and updated and just did an updated version, kind of um, added some more current anecdotes um, and and stories and, and changed the nutrition chapter for the second version. Maybe I'd already done that. Um, and, you know, I'm now looking at the, the stuff that I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at doing another book. Um, and I was really working on it before last Christmas and then God's own happened and I haven't really picked it back up yet, but it, it's, it's going to be based on this. So it'll be kind of under the same idea, but it'll be based more on this idea of maintenance. And I've been, um, uh, talking with Skylar Tanner, who I think, you know, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Good old Skylar. And, and yeah, and we've just been having a lot of conversations, um, about this idea of maintenance and um, what we were talking a little bit about earlier about you know where this need for more comes from and how there's this this I mean 
it's the idea that realistically, if you're doing it right, the plateau is the end result, right? The plateau is not the enemy. Yeah. It's not the thing that you overcome. Like if you're doing it right, if, you, if you're living your life well, if you're taking these steps to optimize your health, right? Then at some point your health becomes optimized, right? Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's, but, but there's nothing to sell to somebody who's figured it out, if that makes sense, right? Yep. If, if you've got the program <laughs> working, right, that person's not buying anything. And so, you know, whether, whether it's a, it's a nefarious aim or whatever, but it, it, it's just so fascinating to me that, that, and, and everybody, not everybody, but, but so many people seem to buy into it and, and they're just seeking, you know, um, more. And we're always being told that we ought to be doing more by the industry. You know, it's always like, oh, you know, you got, you need to get better abs. And yeah. maybe that's true for a lot of people. I mean, in fairness, I don't know how many people are, you know, have figured it out, but I, I think that that one of the challenges that we, you know, to tell people that you can figure it out. I mean, like there's a lot of people fitter than me, Lawrence. Um, there's no question about it, but because I've decided what it is that I need and that I want out of my body. Um, and you know, and my mind is, it's related to that. And I have decided what it's going to take to get there. And I've done that. I'm done. You know, I just yeah. have to keep doing this. This really I mean, resonates it, with me. Sorry, I don't think it's cut you off. Yeah. Mm. No, it's, it's, and it's just, you know, it's, and I, I just, and it, it's, it's similar because I've read a lot of um, the same sort of stuff um, on some of your blogs. And it's just this idea that, you know, um, seeking perfection, you know, like more is, is a recipe for unhappiness. Because yeah. it, it is it is a lifetime pursuit that is never going to come to fruition. You know, it just it just by its very nature. You know, I, you can always theoretically get stronger, add a little bit more to your bicep or whatever, right? In theory, you can always do that. But there's that law of diminishing returns, and at some point, right? Yeah, it's it's, just, it, it's a really it's a really interesting thing to talk about, and something that. Still, I'm, I'm sure plagues all of us, but it plagues me a lot. You know, um, it, you know, I and you may have seen this in my writing, and maybe listened to this on the podcast a bit, and certainly can can read between the lines. But you know, um, you know, I for myself, you know, I'm I'm about well, <laughs> I'm a bit tiny bit fatter than this now, and I'll explain. But um, I was eight percent, around eight percent body fat, 155 yeah. pounds, I'm very slight, you know, slight, lightly muscled individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, uh, I was spending some time with some friends recently and, you know, I get a typical comments that a hard gainer, um, healthy individual will get, which is, you know, you're too thin, you need to put on some weight. Um, and it's, it's, it's can be quite heartbreaking because I, I think people don't realize sometimes just how important this is to us. Uh, when I say us, yeah. I'm not this, saying you, Andy, but me and a lot of the listeners, um, yeah. you know, you work hard to, like you say, optimize health. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know, what, I've plateaued. Uh, I, at least I believe I have. Um, and I look like a hunter gatherer. If you look like, if you look at the old, the pictures of a hunter gatherer, yeah. you know, I look like that. And that's probably, let's be honest, how we're supposed to look, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, at 8% body fat and 155, I look like, I stand like a sore thumb. Like I don't look like everyone else. <laughs> you know? right. Um, and, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's a challenge. And, and, you know, I actually, I had a lot of discourse. Funny you should bring up Skylar. Um, and I think he should write the forward for your book if he, if he hasn't offered already. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I went back and forth with him on email, like, you know, saying, like talking about genetic potential and, and Skylar was, in, you know, cause he's, he's wrote a very, very popular blog post called the six year itch where he tried to, um, achieve the body of his dreams and then kind of quickly realized that he had more of a fitness model, slighter physique and, and genetics that match that. Um, and, and you know, kind of, came to terms with that, but in doing so as, uh, you know, had a far better quality of life and has actually got a fantastic physique, to be honest. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, he kind of really helped, helped kind of con- uh, counsel me on email and uh, gave me some tips on how I could, you know, and I'm sort of playing, playing with, uh, around with a few things, see if I can uh, increase muscle size. But, you know, there's a voice in the back of my head that goes, you know, Lawrence, come on, mate, it really doesn't matter. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, uh, I that's mean, human it's, nature. It's- um, like, so, so, so if, 
if the book happens, it will be a collaboration between Skylar and I. So it oh, won't I just be me. He's, um, yeah, I, I've learned a lot from him um, and, you know, sending articles back and forth and whatnot. Um, but it's, it, it, it's such a like, and and this is it's it's this discussion that we're just now getting into, and we won't really have time to see through. But that that has um, fascinated me now for um, for so long because I'm the same way. Like I, for me, the big thing now is I look at these guys that are it's what it's called calisthenics or something now. The mm-hmm. whole uh, the whole body weight thing. The guys are doing muscle ups and they're doing um, all that bar stuff. Um, you know, I look at those physiques and I'm like, man, I just I want to look like that. Um, <laughs> You know, what, what would I need to do to, to, uh, to look like that and to be able to do all that cool gymnastics? Um, and part of that's just learning the gymnastics, but, um, and, and there's a real pull towards that, you know, I mean that because it's what is out there, you know, and, and, and especially, um, like I've, I've learned that, um, I can't handle that sort of stuff. So f- for me, Facebook is is a business thing, and I, I unfollow everybody. Like I never see anybody on Facebook because I couldn't handle going on there and seeing the pictures of all the you know athletes doing what they're doing. I just I couldn't handle it because it made me competitive and it made me feel like I wasn't doing enough. Um, and you know that doesn't work for everybody because some people have to do that if if you know like you you've got a podcast so you have to have more of a social media presence than I do. Um, but it's a challenge and it's, it's massive challenge. And it's so strange that, um, that there's that pull, you know, we're competitive, uh, especially if, you know, like people like us that are, that are interested in this sort of thing, there's a natural competitiveness, um, and ego and not necessarily even a bad kind of ego that, that drives that to some extent that you can't completely get away from. Right. And, and that's, it's, and it's, it's been, it's been used to our disadvantage in terms of, of what our satisfaction with who we are, um, and, and what we can achieve. And that's just, there's this, there's this, um, there's this tension there that I'm aware of, but being aware of it doesn't actually remove it, you know? Um, and it's, yeah, it's fascinating to me to hear you talk about it the same way, because even when you have these relevations and you realize, you know, I'm probably fine. This is how I'm meant to look, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, you still look at other people and say, "Yeah, but why can't I look like that? Or why can't <laughs> I, I run that fast? Or you know, and what would it take?" And and it's it's been. I, I really am very comfortable with where I'm at now. I just have twinges of that that pull me back towards yeah, that thing. You. Um, but you know, recently it was I was visiting the states for for four weeks, and um, we joined a climbing gym. And we started climbing again. And like I used to be a real serious climber, and being around all those climbers with their massive forearms and the veins everywhere on their arms, and watching them, I started thinking, "Oh man, how can I get back there? That's what I want now. I need to be stronger." And it took it took really thinking and saying, right, but I don't have any place to climb in New Zealand. That's not where my life is focused. So can I do what I want? Yeah. And to let that go, because, you know, you look around, there's a lot of cool things to do in this world, you know, Um, and it's pretty easy um, to think that we should be able to do this, that or the other thing. And and we can't do it all right. And yeah, I remember uh, one thing that really sticks in my mind is um you know, I interviewed John Little a couple of times. He's the co-author of Body by Science. And, yeah. uh, you know, he's he's such a wise man. And he said something to me. Um, he said, uh, you know, why are we judging someone based on the size of their bicep? Um, because, you know, we we do. I mean, we, we, we seem to really, even those in the um, evidence-based resistance kind of paradigm who understand the role of genetics, you know, yeah. they will really celebrate that. And that's fine. I'm not I'm not disparaging those people that have big biceps or, or saying that they haven't worked hard to get that, but it's there is more to life for sure. Uh, and you're like you're saying, if you're trying to chase the optimum, whatever that is for you in terms of like muscular potential, you might miss out on something more important. Um and I and I think, you know what, us talking about this, Andy, is it's really cool because I imagine there's a lot of listeners right now, and I, I know because I, I talk to them regularly on social and email, who are shaking yeah. their heads, oh sorry, nodding their heads <laughs> in agreement. Um and so hopefully this is this is helpful to them. Well, it, it's it's one of those things that I and that's when when Skylar and I were talking, which is 
I feel there'd be a benefit to having it talked about more because there, the culture yeah. as it is right now, you know, it, it, it breeds inadequacy or feelings of inadequacy, you know, because how, how many people actually look like um, the people in the bro science articles, you know, that are that are just everywhere. It just, you know, and, and it, they always make you believe that it's 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 possible. And maybe, you know, you know, like, oh, this is my transformation from this to this. And, you know, don't get me started on the paid actors and all that kind of stuff that you can, you know, you can find out about. But it's just it's crazy. It's just um, it, it's marketing and it's a genius. It's it's absolutely genius because it it it, it picks up on our our fears um, and our, our insecurities Um yeah, but it's it just I don't I don't feel like it's doing anybody any good. You know, it's, I'm all for getting stronger. I'm all for maximizing potential, but um, I just think there's a more positive way that we can do it, largely than, than what the culture um, is offering. So I agree. And um, couple things, I I'm complete hypocrite because I am in the background slightly increasing my calorie intake to see if I can. Um, you know, increase muscle mass. <laughs> um, because I actually realized that I've been eating, uh, or apparently is a below maintenance, um, calorie intake for a very long period of time. And that's because I, I kind of, I've got into the whole uh, high protein movement and found that's yeah. worked quite well for me. And what happens is it satiates you so much that you, you don't eat as much naturally, or at least I don't. Um, right. And so that's been quite interesting. So I'm just exploring that. But just um, curious on your views on actors for a second. I mean, I hope you don't mind if we dive into that for a moment. Yeah, um, you right. know, I remember speaking to God. We've gone some wild directions on this podcast. Yeah. Um, I I remember speaking to Steve Maxwell about this, and he was, um, you know, completely convinced, hundred percent, that all of the actors that do the crazy transformations, like Christian Bale for Batman, and you know, um, Henry Cavill for Superman and yeah. so on. They're all using steroids to get those results and those trans, those fast transformations, obviously in tandem with diets and training and the rest of it. But, and they probably also have pretty good genetics too. And uh, if you look yeah. at their frames, uh, although Christian Bauer, I don't know, but what do you think about that? Do you think they're all on steroids and stuff like that? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, that there's probably a lot more, um, of either steroid use or other performance enhancing drugs that, that that goes around than people talk about. I mean, you know, clearly it happens in, in high level sports all the time. Um, but uh, my, my personal view is that, um, I mean, it, it's clearly going on at, at, in bodybuilding and, and probably in, you know, upper levels of CrossFit and, and stuff like that. I mean, I know they do testing, but that's, that's largely a sham. I, I imagine in, in most sports, um, and you know, I, I've just kind of stopped caring because I, I, I know my decision is, is it's not worth it because, of course, yeah. I, um, and I think there's so many other things, uh, or, or other, you know, there's other things that are done that create a false image. It's, it's the same thing with like with women have to deal with airbrushing, you know, when they're looking at their ideal body, it's, it's airbrushed and stuff like that. Right. And so and I, I was talking more about, you know, when you see these transformation peoples on uh, these transformation pictures before and after on not necessarily of celebrities, but of the people in the magazines that are selling the programs or whatever, you know, it's all it's all done with tanning and pumping up and, and drinking to make you look fat. You know, like I've seen these expositions yeah. where it's, you know, the guy's drinking two bottles of soda and then he's standing there with his gut out. And then the next day, you know, the picture's taken it's the before pictures taken after and what it just, it's all, it's an image that's created, um, as the media does to sell a product, you know? And, and, and it, it, like when you see the actors, you know, the other thing was actors when you see actors and they're looking as, as ripped as imaginable, you know, they've, they've, they have a trainer that has basically figured out how to make them as cut as possible for that scene. You know, nobody looks like that all the time. Yeah, for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly, for an hour or maybe a day, right? Nobody looks like that all the time. Like you just – and and we uh, – through Hollywood and through magazines, we have come to believe – like even the guys that are doing the YouTube videos, right? You see the guys that are doing the YouTube videos that are um, impossibly cut up doing their bodyweight routines or whatever. 
Um, and they're always there with their shirts off, of course. It's like they, they don't own shirts or something. Um, <laughs> and, and they're just impossibly cut. And, to, and then, you know, I've, I've looked at a couple of those guys, you know, if you look at their Facebook pictures, because sometimes I'm a Facebook stalker when I get into these modes. <laughs> and, then, um, and then invariably, you'll see pictures where they look more normal, where they've got, you know, still low body fat, but not 2%, you know, they, they've got more like 12%. And so they're, they're obviously fit, but they don't look like a statue, you know, I just, yeah. So that it's just, it's, it's a bit maddening that that is what, um, you know, I feel for women who have probably more of an issue because, um, all of society kind of puts them into this ideal. But, um, for guys that are, you know, trying to kind of get into high level fitness, man, it's, it's the same thing, you know, um, it's the same thing. We really have these unrealistic expectations of, what it means to be a fit um, man um, that if you can't get away from it, if you can't make your peace with, man, you're just always going to feel less than. So even when you're not, you know, it's like, I, like when I really, really look at it, I, without question, am, am very fit. You know, I can run fast. I can move my body weight a lot. I'm, you know, I'm strong in a lot of different disciplines. And yet, it's still very easy for me to get online um, and and feel like I'm just a fat ass slob, you know? It's crazy. Yeah, Do you know what? You raise a really good point. It's like even if you're and because you, you come across incredibly, you know, um, mentally healthy in in terms of how you think about this and how you think about your own body and your own health. Um, yeah, you can be there, right? You can be, you can really work on that and cultivate that great attitude and mindset. But if you then fall into the habit of going on Instagram and looking at all the filtered pictures uh, and Facebook, then it doesn't matter how much you've got your shit together, that can creep in. It's really insidious, like you're saying. And it and it comes down to your, your information diet, which we really, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, you know what Tim Ferriss popularized the you know cultivating selective ignorance in terms of all of the media you consume and uh, I fall off the bandwagon all the time you know like you say I'm on social not very good at it but I am on it um, and you know I, I I always get pulled into a, a YouTube or uh, Instagram rabbit hole <laughs> yeah and it's incredibly unhealthy um, so you're reminding me to um, really start creating some better habits there for myself I mean and, and that's it's I like that term information diet and and you're absolutely right and it's it doesn't matter um it doesn't matter where you're at like I haven't found a way to manage it without just removing it I mean maybe there is a way but for me it's like you say even though I'm I'm at the at the tail end of the world in a tiny town man I get online and it just yeah, yeah it's it, it it's insidious. It just that's exactly and and it's it's not social media's fault except that um it just it, it it I don't know it just it creates a sense of of you know fear of missing out and and then the the partner of that is you know of, of like this idea that you're not doing enough that you're not um and there's there's I used to call the same thing um something called Camp Four phenomenon. So when I was a climber um, back when I was in my twenties. Um, there was a, a famous place called Camp Four in Yosemite Valley, and so I spent the summer there. And I'm I'm with my brother, and we're in Camp Four, and we just come down off this awesome climb. Um, we we're really proud of ourselves, and we come down, and then we hear all these climbers, you know, groups of climbers saying, "Oh, I'm going to go do this big climb tomorrow. I'm going to go do this one." And what I found is that I put in my head all of those climbers into one person. I made them all one person in my head kind of unconsciously and that I could never measure up to, right? And so when I'm sitting there in camp four, I never feel like a good climber no matter what route I've just come off. You know, I never feel like I'm measuring up. And that's kind of what I feel happens with Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. There's so many great images. You know, all your friends and all the people that are in your circle, um, you know, they might be having one wonderful vacation a year. But when that gets posted and then you see it directly below your other friend who's in another place doing this thing and your other friend who's, you know, just had this CrossFit high jump or whatever, it it, it all becomes one person in your head. You don't differentiate. Yeah. yeah. So now, now, you know, the whole world is is doing more than you are. And whatever you're doing, 
sitting, which at that time is nothing because you're sitting there looking at your computer, right? <laughs> like, Do you know what? This is, this is um, a couple of things I want to say to this. Uh, you've got me going now, Andy. Is, um, yeah, yeah. is, is, this this type of thing, like I'm I'm really guilty of following like all of the online entrepreneurs, you know, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Tim Ferriss, yeah. and you know, and I think they're great, and I think they a lot of the times, um, you know, talk some really good stuff and uh, are very yeah. very helpful, um, especially Tim. However, what I've noticed is if I do too much of that, that I don't feel like well, obviously I'm not getting much done because I'm distracted anyway, um, but. I I start developing really bad working habits. So when I'm actually at my best is when I really, I don't know how familiar you are with like Tim's principles of, you know, uh, well, he kind of reiterates Peter Drucker, the effective executive and uh, always picking the, you know, the tasks that are the most effective over being efficient and doing less but more important stuff, um, yeah. which has always worked for me. And it's, truly what the podcast and the business behind the podcast is built on is it's those principles really um yeah i still fall in the trap sometimes of going oh if i'm not busy if i've not got a day where my calendar's full then i'm not working hard enough which is complete bullshit um right. and, and yet if i if i'm not vigilant about it's my own consumption of some of these some of this media then i fall into that trap so that's another downside and and also what you said about facebook you know me and my uh, girlfriend joke about it. So we call it the highlight reel, because um, yeah. you know you must have this had this happen where you see someone on Facebook, you know, and you think, oh, they're so happy, they're having such a great time, and then you meet them in person and they're like depressed, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you don't see that because they're trying they're trying to present the best version of themselves online, and yeah. you don't know that. Um, and, and so I always tell people that like whenever you, cause people say to me or people say to Ash, my girlfriend, like, oh, you guys have such an interesting life. And I'm like, hey, we actually stay in all the time and do nothing like, you know? <laughs> but you don't know that cause you just see Ashling's really cool Instagram stories and stuff like that. Absolutely. So we, we always try and remind people that, you know, what the reality is. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, this all dovetails back into, you know, cultivate, get off social media, like, you know, um, or, or at least tame it and use it really, uh, you know, and you, when you need to for like, I don't know, yeah. connect with friends or whatever, or business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it just, yeah, use it, um, use it as opposed to letting it use you, you know, and it's, I don't know how else to say it, but it is, it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it's such a fascinating thing. I mean, there's so much cool stuff. If you'd really just have time to waste, it's a great way to waste time. You know, <laughs> you can see so many cool videos and, um, you know, whatever, but boy, if, if you're trying not to waste time, then, then yeah, you just got to shut it down. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, I, I'm very focused on a couple projects this year and, uh, you know, I started watching this, this guy on YouTube and I really liked the way he was doing his videos and he's one of these like fitness YouTubers. He's very likable, Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I could do that. I could, I could get a camera and I could start doing like documenting my days. And, you know, I, I think I can be fairly funny and I could be also informational and help, you know, educational and all of that. Um, you know, talk about things like fitness and time management and business and stuff like that. And then I thought, you know what, if I do that, it's just another, another thing, another project that really isn't actually, you know, if you, if it's all, if we're looking at like, you know, through, um, you know the book Essentialism. Have you ever read that at all? No, I have. Okay, so uh, author's Greg McCowan, I think, uh, English guy, and very, very popular book all about productivity, um, yep. clues in the title, obviously. And uh, you know, if you look at what's really essential to me right now, it's it's uh, you know this 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 podcast and the the membership that I is my main service where I help strength training entrepreneurs grow their business. Um, and then it's uh, I've got a uh, you know. A, a, a plan to open a gym in Galway in Ireland with uh, my business partner here. So that's the other project. And it's like, well, I don't, I feel pressure to throw another project in there because I'm consuming it and it's appealing yeah. to me, but it's, it's a distraction and it's not, you know, it's like, if you try and do all of them, you do none of them, you know, it's better off yeah. to look at it. You know, you can do a lot over a longer term if you do one at a time or, you know, you know, I think no, you know where I'm going. I'm not articulating that all that well, but <laughs> it, I mean, you're you're absolutely right, and I think it's it's especially tough if you are a creative individual that has um, these passions that you can see yeah. 
go many different ways. I mean, I, I at one point, one, right after moving to New Zealand or about a year after, I kind of I came up with a list because I had all these potential projects, if you will. And the list was just, it, it was crazily long. It was like, you know, 12 items where I could actually have um, put my efforts into and seen have developing either a successful business or, or another book or, uh, um, yeah. you know, various different things. And that I was passionate about all of them. And then I just had to think, this is crazy because if I, if I even delve into half of them, I'm not going to get anywhere, yeah. you know, and, and, and that it's tough, it's tough making those choices, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, you look at that and yes, you could be successful doing the, um, the YouTube videos without question. You know, you've got enough of a, um, of an interest to people, you know, enough. Um, but if you do that, like you say, what does that mean to the other stuff you're doing? And that's invariably, it means at this point that the quality of that's going to go downhill. There's going to be, you know, less success there. So it's 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 tough, you know, because I always wish that you know joke about wanting just multiple lives because all this stuff I really want to do it, but <laughs> if I try to do it all, then all of it kind of fails. If that makes sense, so it does. Andy, this has been so much fun. And I want to ask you one final question before yeah. I get your contact details. Um, yeah. I mean, I could talk for ages, but um, it's getting a bit late where I am. Um, no worries. What, you know, um, I, I love asking this question because it's been a while since we spoke. It's been, what, three years pretty much. Um, you know, what, if anything, have you changed your mind about in relation to health, fitness or nutrition um, over the last few years or in recent memory? Um, so uh, there's, I'll, I'll give two answers. One will be, I'll start with nutrition. Um, and like, I've always kind of had a, a pretty basic, um, view of nutrition in the sense of just, just keep it simple. I, uh, Michael Pollan's my favorite guy with the whole eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, and that for me, I know there's a lot of different diets going around. Um, but I, my take on that is, you know, you see super athletes who swear by veganism, you see super athletes who swear by paleo and, you know, however many other different diets there are. And I look at the cross section of all those and I say, hey, they're all not eating too much. They're all eating mostly plants. And so that's what I'm, you know, it's, it, it's, it doesn't matter if you're eating meat or not in my estimation. I eat meat personally. I love it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I just don't put a lot of stock in the specifics of nutrition above about that 80% commonality. The other stuff I figure as long as you got that 80% commonality, um, which is not overeating and not eating a lot of processed stuff. Um, I figure that's worked for me. Um, but what I have done more recently is I'm doing this thing called intermittent, inter intermittent fasting. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Sure you... Yeah. Familiar. I do it myself. <laughs> and, and I just, um, for me, it was more, um, a product of I was naturally skipping breakfast. Um, I just never ate it and it, it pissed my wife off to no end. She was like, why aren't you eating breakfast? But I just, I didn't and I didn't feel any worse for it. And I, it was one of the things that I was talking to Skylar about and found out he did. And so then I thought, you know, I'm going to try this. And I've been trying that now f um, for, for quite a while, but just the last month more um, systematically. And I love it. It's awesome. Um, just and, just uh, on that, um, you know, um, I, I was, I'm just curious, you know, what you and uh, what Skylar's rationale is for intermittent fasting, because, you know, there's obviously the the argument around having a, a smaller eating window, so you end up eating less calories on an, on average. Uh, but then there's things like, you know, you're you're giving your body a break from food. It triggers things like autophagy and which is you know, cell kind of detoxing um, and also increases things like uh, growth hormone. So there is a theory that uh, it can improve things like lean muscle retention and, and growth. Is, is that why you do it? I mean, what were the, the reasons for you? Is it just a convenience thing or is there other, other motives? Well, like for one, it was, um, it was this a little bit of this, um, this fascination with self-experimentation and just seeing how I would do, but I, I found that oftentimes um, I was doing it anyway. Like I would go out um, for a day in the bush um, and I would forget my food. And so I'd be hiking along a trail all day. I wouldn't really eat until I got to the hut at five o'clock. And, and I didn't really feel any worse for wear. So I was intrigued by 
Um, and, and the people I was with were like just starving at lunch and having these massive lunches. And I was like, I, what, you know, they were asking me, aren't you going to eat? And I said, well, no, I'm not really hungry. So I was just kind of curious as to what was different. Um, and, um, and then I, I looked into it a little bit, like I haven't necessarily done all the research that you've done, but for me, I always well, I kind of looked, all that much. <laughs> uh, well, well, like you mentioned a lot of things that, that I, I hadn't even heard of, but, um, you know, I, I just have always, um, been a critical thinker about things like diet and the idea that you have to eat three meals a day or a lot of small meals. And it just, it does, it all rings hollow to me in, in the wake of how people must have used to eat, um, from evolutionary perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just didn't make sense that, that we needed such a regimented structure for optimal health, Mm -hmm. um, because that wouldn't have ever existed outside of the modern era, you know? Um, and, and so I just let myself kind of play with it and I'm not rigid about it. Like I don't have a, an alarm that goes off and says, oh, oh, I can eat now kind of a thing. But for me, it's roughly about a six hour eating window, um, every day. And I just have found it's, it's great. I don't try to, um, restrict my calories. I don't try to eat, you know, more protein or anything like that. I eat pretty, um, much my normal, um, calories to sustain my weight, um, between that window, but I just, I find I'm not hungry. And you don't track calories either, right? I don't track calories. No. Um, so I'm not, I, I've, I've thought about trying, but you know, with the meals I eat, it's kind of, you know, and I have a stir fry for dinner. Shit. I don't know how many calories. Are in <laughs> Massive you know, margin so, for error, I suppose. Yeah. It'd be a bit artificial. You know, I, yeah. I could either make it seem like I was eating more or less just by, um, yeah. So I, I don't, I just, I, I go more on, feel like my default is if I'm hungry at the end of the night before that, you know, window closes before I go to bed, uh, it's peanut butter because it's real calorie dense. Um, nice. and it's, um, yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's the one change I've made. I'm, I'm experimenting with that and I haven't noticed any difference in energy levels. I haven't noticed any difference, um, in terms of the high intensity training. One thing I do feel is I do feel usually very light during the day, which is awesome because I'm not weighed down by food because my eating windows in the evening from about three to nine. Um, and so, um, during my workouts, even if I have a little bit of that, that sense of hunger, um, I usually feel like I'm performing uh, pretty well. Yeah. Um, did you, the one question I have for you, I don't know we're getting long, but, um, did you notice any like issue with, um, like when I started this, I noticed um, what I assumed was some level of uh, ketosis or something like that, like my urine changed color um, for a couple of weeks. Mm. Did you notice anything? I haven't noticed that. No, uh, I've been doing it for a long time now, but I've never, I've never paid enough attention to that. Right, um, right. But yeah, that would that would potentially make sense if you're. Um, I mean, what what were you doing previously? Like eating like three meals a day. Well, well I, I was never really eating breakfast, but I'd usually have something in the morning, either, you know, banana, like I wasn't getting up and having a full breakfast. So, I, but I was, I was definitely eating more regularly in the morning. And I guess what I've read suggests that when you do it more structurally, then your body does kind of, um, processes stuff in a certain way that, um, yeah, you, you, you go into a, a, a state of ketosis during that fast. You know, you start to do that. Um, and then I, I don't know if it's true or not, but there, there was quite a few websites on intermittent fasting that was mentioning that. So I just thought yeah, that would make sense that you would be you would be in ketosis um, through the morning. Uh, that would totally make sense. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I'm no expert, but it just seems to make sense yeah. to me. One thing I have noticed is um, it's difficult because I'm, I'm trying to hit I'm for the first time in ages. I'm actually tracking calories, which is a pain in the ass but things like fitness power make it quite a little easier um and i'm tracking i'm targeting 2800 a day um which is a lot for me i'm used to eating like probably just over 2000 uh and i've noticed that when you do intermittent fasting it's very very hard for at least for me to hit that target because you just feel so full (laughs) because you're eating these big meals in this like you know restricted window um right and it's uh it's uh it's challenging so again it kind of confirms to me how it can be very effective for fat loss um from that perspective in terms of you know just kind of 
m- making you eat less as a byproduct of this like constricted window. Um, yeah. Assuming you're eating the right things, you know, if people are eating like, you know, well, a lot I was of high calorie say, processed crap, then you've got, you've got to start having some high quality pro- processed crap, some high calorie. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I do it. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be hard, right? I mean, like for me, it's it, like peanut butter is my go to because I, I, I don't know. I just Americans, you know, they love peanut butter. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a couple, couple tablespoons of that is, is pretty caloric. Um, so yeah. I usually put chocolate chips on mine to get more calories. <laughs> <laughs> I know because I most of my meals are like steak, uh, some yeah. rice, some potato, vegetables, lots of eggs. Steak and eggs is the the staple, really. Yeah. I, I I live on, um, and yeah, it's just so satiating that you're like, God, I've got I've got to get another six hundred calories in, but I'm stuffed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, like you are gonna feel you're gonna feel stuffed, and again, but this comes back to this idea that. Um, you know, just playing devil's advocate that maybe, um, and you know, you'll figure this out. It's, it's a good experiment, but maybe what you're trying to do is, I mean, in, in some ways, you know, you've got the body type you've got, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, it'd be interesting to, to visit with you in a couple of years and, and see, see how this has gone for you. But is that, you know, I, I think of things in terms of equilibrium. So are you trying uh-huh. to put your body to a place where it's not going to be in equilibrium and then you're constantly going to be struggling to to keep that extra muscle mass right so yeah. there's these that that's a question and it'll be interesting to see i mean there's there's no harm in doing it right but you know if, if you're struggling to eat 2800 calories an hour and when you get that muscle mass you're going to need to keep eating 2800 calories an hour unless your appetite substantially increases so that's easy you know you're like you're wondering if it's it's kind of like to maintain a really high level of fitness that's a non-equilibrium position as well. You know, you're peaking for a race. You can't stay there. I actually really agree with what you're saying. Uh, You know, someone said to me, who I really respect, uh, Nick Patterson, and you can, he's over on Twitter. um, uh, I think his handle's LF, uh, low fat, no, HF, Oh, hey, oh, low fat, low information, something like that. Um, But yeah, anyway, he, (laughs) he was on the podcast recently and he said to me, you know, don't, don't do this, Lawrence, because it's not your phenotype. You know, it's not it's not right. natural to do that. It's not it's not going to correlate well with with longevity and health span. And you know, I kind of agree. You know? <laughs> um, and I think you might be right. I think there's a, everyone has a body set point, right? Um, and I think you know uh, there is definitely. I remember reading that. I think as you um, as you do eat more, your protein enzymes is it protein or your digestive enzymes do upregulate, so you are able to eat more. Um, uh, you know, but then there's the argument. I remember Skylar saying, you know, when he, when he put on a lot of weight back in the day, you know, it's just too much for his skeleton. It's too much for his foundation. Um, you know, it might be that this is the thing. It might be for me that actually I really need to consume only a tiny bit more than I was in order to see progress in terms of, you know, more muscle mass. And I am actually probably consuming quite a bit more than that. Um, and I, it's quite likely that I'll taper it down, but you're quite right. You know, we could talk in a year. And I'll say, you know, what, Andy, that was a waste of my time. It was fully fueled by my ego. <laughs> you know? um, well, and you and know, so, in, in fairness, there, although, you know, I always forget this, but there's probably quite a few people, right, that um, that that are interested in that that hunter gather um, body type, and would look at a picture of you with your shirt <laughs> off and be like, "Dude, man, I, I I would love to get as lean as that guy." <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's like I never imagined that with myself, but you know, it, it's yeah. there's there's you know there's all the people out there that are there that are searching for a way to be you know you're probably not a bad way you know you're fit you're 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 managing your body weight well yeah um yeah, yeah. no i appreciate that yeah. it's funny you're um, just on no, the- I'm just in here. yeah here it goes yeah no i appreciate you you saying that and, and it's interesting you say that because my my girlfriend's like are you are you mental like because she thinks i look great and yeah. you know um and that's obviously great that she thinks that and uh, you know you're right i do get a lot of nice comments from people and it's like you know it's like it's funny because there are that's the thing the grass is greener type of um is that the right expression probably not but it's 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 that whole yeah. it's that whole you yeah. want what you can't have right and you know yeah. i i for instance and you're probably similar to me like i can get really really ripped i can get like eight pack abs quite easily yeah. and there are a lot of people that can't do that and so they look at me in awe and then i look at the guy with the 
17, 18 inch bicep. And I'm like, I'd like that, you know? <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's, it's tough because coupled with that, that entrepreneurial spirit, which is, which is to, you know, to see something that is just beyond where you're at and say like, I can go get that, you know? So, so th- there's that positive, it, that. Yeah. but, but combined with, you know, the, the reality of what you're facing. Yeah. APAC abs. I think that'd be awesome, man. Yeah. yeah, so I don't have either the biceps or the eight pack abs. So <laughs> yeah, on both counts. Yeah, but you've got you did you got seventh place in God's own, so you know yeah. that's yeah. Your, that's your thing. Um, but no, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna correct what I said. I actually don't think you know. I see guys who are like really big and bulky. I don't like that at all. I would always want to be more. You know, like Martin Burkhan. You know him, the lean yeah. gains guy. Like, yeah, he's got you know great physique, but he still looks very he's very slender, but very muscular at the same time. Um, and so I suppose that would be, that's kind of more what I have always coveted, you know, right. Not that I don't look at the bodybuilders and, you know, admire, you know, inspire to be like that. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, yep. but anyway, it's a pointless thing to say really, but yeah. Um, yep. Andy, this has been so much fun. Uh, I'm really pleased that we just went on a huge digression, all sorts of different directions. Um, it's been good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I really enjoyed it. Um, what's the the best way for the listeners to find out more about you? Um, I've got a a website for the book. Um, that's ultramentalbook.com. Um, and yeah, that's probably a good way. And that's got my email address. And I'm always happy to you know have have interested people get in touch with me. Um, and start up dialogues and whatnot. Um, and yeah, so that's probably the best way that, that kind of gives my contact details. And, and if they're interested in, in finding out more about kind of my high intensity approach to endurance stuff, then there's the book there and I've got a few free re- resources there, some training programs I've developed over the years. Um, yeah, so that's a good start. And, uh, you know, for the listeners, I do highly, highly recommend Andy's book, um, Ultra Mental because, you know, I read it before our first podcast together and I just found it so inspiring and so well written and I'm sure it's even better now that you've updated it um, and to all those listening to find the blog post for this episode please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Magnus that's M-A-G-N-E-S-S uh, and for all episodes please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast and until next time guys thank you so much for listening I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get a bunch of goodies, including number one, a free ebook of podcast transcripts with some of my top guests like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Bill De Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss and overall health in an efficient, effective and sustainable way. Number two, a free high intensity training business checklist to help you get more clients in your business. And number three, a free high intensity training training Google Sheet to help you track and improve your training progress. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field.